Hi, I'm Jason Myers. I'm a content manager at Influx Data. And I'm Sam Dillard. I'm a product manager for all things Edge at Influx Data. And today we're going to talk about retaining data shape uh, when downsampling to cloud. Sure. So, Sam, I know we're also focused on replication these days. What is the relationship between replication and downsampling? Good question. So, the primary driver for creating the replications feature was with the Edge in mind, and really an Edge cloud duality, having a relationship between those two things. Okay. The edge is increasing in its data volume across the market, basically, and, and that data is growing in its gravity. What the problem is, is that that data, as it's growing, is becoming less likely to be able to move to cloud in its original form, its, its, its high fidelity, right? So with replications is going to inherently come with some sort of data reduction. And, and in time series, we call that downsampling. Okay. Downsampling is just a, the industry term for aggregation or summarization over time temporal aggregation. With data reduction, it not only does it allow users and operators to stay within business constraints, you know, do they have the bandwidth to, to write that data over, over to the cloud, but like it's cost savings too. You don't sure. have to buy as much bandwidth or supply yourself with, with as much bandwidth. And cloud storage costs, you're writing less data to cloud, so you have to store less over time and you can store it for longer. Sure. And then ultimately query Query uh, performance is faster, right? You have less data to scan and less data to compute. Okay, so it sounds like there are a lot of benefits to downsampling. Are there any downsides to downsampling? Yeah, there can be. So inherently, downsampling is a lossy operation. So you're going to lose some data. You have to lose at least one one data point, right, to, for it to be <laughs> downsampling. Um, the question is, how do you downsample? And there's thousands of ways to downsample using different different methodologies. Um, the most common are your basic statistical functions like min, mean, max, median, mode, count, like those things. And for a lot of people and a lot of data sets, that's actually, that'll suffice. What it will do is give you kind of a smoothing of your graph or, or, or sort of a, a derivative of your graph and then it won't um, retain the shape super well and it won't retain interesting moments necessarily. But um, if your data is normally distributed and you don't necessarily have to, to retain the interesting moments, that generally suffices. That's a sacrifice people can make. All right. So so can you explain, this looks like this might be explaining some of that. Can you walk us through it real quick? Yeah, of course. So the this example is basically taking a uh, two data sets that are, this is the original data set that's raw, high fidelity, and it would probably be at the edge. You might find this at, you know, at the factory, right? Sure. Where you have operators who want the detail and they're they're only looking at it for a day or a week or something like that. Here, we have the data that we want. We want to turn it into this or turn it into something smaller and store that in the cloud. So what we have to do is apply some kind of downsampling or aggregation function to this data to turn it into something smaller. And in this case, I'm showing mean. Generally speaking, this is probably OK for most data sets, right? Or for at least a lot of data sets. But you'll notice that it's completely lost some of these interesting peaks and troughs, right? And, and even some of these outlying points here. So um, if you can make that sacrifice, then it's a, it's a super cheap function to run and it, and it, and it reduces data quite a bit. Um, but there are ways to retain that shape. Okay, so if I want to retain some of those interesting points, uh, what are some options for uh, data aggregators that I can use for that? Yeah, good question. So this gets us to the value of Flux. Flux has built into it a ton of functions that allow sort of a ton of flexibility in how you want to aggregate or do your downsampling, right? Okay, yep. But even more than that, it's a functional scripting language. So you can create your own custom functions. And that's what we'll show here um, with, instead of listing out functions that are built in. Um, let's go back to the, to the data, kind of what we showed on the mean. This, this okay. original, the raw data here is high fidelity, high frequency. This is the stuff that you might find in your open source node at the edge. Right. And this, you know, it's we, we store it this way because there are people that actually care about the detail. They care about the peaks and the troughs. They care about the interesting moments, the shape of the data generally, right? Um, they want to alert on, on stuff that's really detailed potentially. But in the cloud, we might not care about that. And sometimes we don't care about the shape or the interesting moments at all. And instead, we just want to know how many interesting moments happened, right? So count over threshold is a function that you can implement in Flux very easily. 
that counts the number of times a series breaks some threshold that the user defines. It's, it's that simple. All right, and so it looks like you have some, some flux code here that's explaining how to, how to do this count over threshold. Maybe you can walk us through that and give us a little primer. Yeah, so super briefly, that um, this is the raw implementation of this count over threshold function. But because it's a raw implementation and there's no windowing in it, it's just gonna give you back one data point, right? Okay. So what we wanna do, if we want a line graph or a history, right, we wanna put this in a, window, a windowing operation. So we have this function aggregate window, which is a super performant windowing function in Flux that takes that defines windows, we'll call it five minutes here. Um, we'll say that we're still looking back 30 minutes, but we're defining windows of five minutes and feeding our new function that we've created, count over threshold, into that so that we're, we're actually returning the counts of these times per time window. And that's what gives us this graph. So this graph, zero to five, right, is the first window, zero, breaks of the threshold, right? We mm -hmm. notice that here. In the, in the second window, again, we apply the function, we find three threshold breaks. Third window, one, fourth window, another one, right? This is obviously getting rid of all of the raw values, right? right? So sometimes that's not appropriate for your use case. Maybe you have a different function that, that actually does retain them, but what it is giving us is an idea of the frequency of the interesting moments. And what that could be used for, for instance, is like I could create a, another threshold on this graph that I then alert on. If I have more than four or five threshold breaks in a window, then I can alert on that, right? So sure. instead of alerting on every threshold break, I can, I can reduce the noise and alert on a string of threshold breaks right. or so that might indicate there's some weird activity going right. on. So like this one's at three and three's below the threshold, so it's, but it's, if we get five, you know, in, 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 a, in a window, that's a problem. We need, we need to take a look at it. Totally, yeah. So, all right, cool. So, again, like you said, this takes away a lot, a lot of the, the granular data. What if I want to retain the shape of my data and some of the interesting points? So I have an option for that? Yes. So okay. there's really just a, a gradient of, you know, from basic to advanced functions that you can apply here. And there are some pretty mathy algorithms out there that will, in fact, retain not only the shape of the data but also the interesting moments themselves, like the actual values and the timestamps of those moments. Um, so there's things like swinging door right here. Swinging door trending is really what it's called. There's uh, largest triangle, one bucket, largest triangle, three buckets. There's the Raymer Douglas Puker algorithm. There's a ton out there. Um, and they're all designed to either, um, in two different ways, either retain sh shape and the interesting moments by selecting points um, that kind of follow the shape, and then there's ones that actually use statistical methods inside of them to decide the weight, which, which points are actually the most important. Okay. We're not gonna talk about math here, but um, as Good. an example, <laughs> yeah, as an example, the swinging door algorithm, which is a really common IoT edge downsampling algorithm, um, can be applied to your edge data, just like this. So again, we were back to the high fidelity edge data at right. your factory, right? Um, there's lots, to, lots of stuff going on here, but this time the people back, you know, doing analytics in the cloud actually do care about what this generally looked like, and they want, they need the values and the timestamps of the times of the interesting moments, right? So they can't okay. just discard that with some aggregate function like mean. So applying swinging door basically uh, looks at the the time series and decides which points are basically irrelevant. They don't, they don't affect or impact the shape that much. And then when it finds the ones that impact the shape the most, it saves that point essentially and discards the rest. So okay. we not only retain the shape of the data, but we also retain the exact moments. So these, this value here is that value right there. It's not making up anything or, de or deriving new values. These are the real values from the original data set stored, but we're reducing the data a ton again, to make queries in cloud faster, make storage cost less, and actually be able to handle the bandwidth constraints. All right, well, this is really interesting. So for folks in companies that want to uh, use this replication feature and they need to downsample data, there's a lot of options for them. You can do just the, the means to smooth out that data. You can use the count over threshold to retain those interesting events, or you can use something like the swinging door to retain the shape of the data and those interesting events and you can do it all with Flux. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's pretty awesome, pretty powerful. Thanks for all this information, it's good stuff. You're welcome. Hopefully that's interesting for you and useful. Uh, we can't wait to see what you build.